Can you join the Civil War? But when the enemy gets a foothold into your fort, it pretty quickly falls apart. Not at Fort Fisher. The battle goes on here for hours. Very fierce fighting over these mounds that we see here. A big part of the U.S. military's plan to win the war is a, was a blockade of the South called the Anaconda Plan. So they're going to cut off the South from the rest of the world. So that involved capturing points along the coast, uh, bases for the ships to operate from, and that plan went pretty well. By December 1864, the war is almost over, and the only major port left to the Confederacy is... Wilmington, uh, just up uh, the Cape Fear River from where we are today. So, uh, <clears throat> Wilmington, the Confederates recognized the importance of it because it was only one of, you know, the only places that blockade runners could go and bring in the goods they needed to fight the war. So this was the second heaviest defended port in the South after Charleston, South Carolina. And Charleston was, blo the blockade was going pretty well there so they couldn't get ships out at this point. The key to Wilmington's defenses was Fort Fisher. It's constructed on a narrow spit of land between the Cape Fear River and the ocean. So Wilmington is this direction to the, generally the, the north of here. South, there is just a point of land where the river goes into the ocean. So the, the main defenses of Fort Fisher were a mile of sea defenses 22 guns, big guns, that would be able to keep Union ships from sailing up the river and keep them far enough out that blockade runners could go down the river and avoid the Union ships. But to avoid having this fort be captured from the land, we have a third of a mile of land defenses. This was 15 mounds um, with 25 cannon. In front, there's a palisade to stop troops that might try to charge up. There are also landmines, they call them torpedoes. So this is uh, some, some pretty strong defensive works. This fort was built of earth. You don't see stone, you have a little bit of wood for the palisade, but it's mostly earth, which is a pretty big advantage because that way when cannonballs hit it, they just sink in and get absorbed and don't shatter and crumble. Today, most of the fort is gone. Uh, pretty much the entire seawall has eroded um, and so we only have a bit of the land wall left. So December 1864, an expedition under Benjamin Butler from the Army of the James and the largest fleet of the war under David Porter, they come here to try to capture the fort. The Federals start by bombarding the fort. They fire 10,000 shells without doing much damage. Butler lands his men, but then he looks at the fort. He decides, I can't capture that. It's not really damaged by the artillery. So he just gets back on the ship and says the fort's impregnable. Grant doesn't like this idea. Uh, he relieves Butler of command, replaces him with Alfred Terry, and comes back. And Butler is shown to be a real fool when the fort falls just a couple weeks later. The fort's garrison is only 1,900 men, all North Carolinians. The district commander is W.H.C. Whiting, and he was begging the area commander, Braxton Bragg, for more troops. There were 6,400 troops nearby, but Bragg refuses to send any more troops. He thinks he needs to keep them in Wilmington, but actually if this fort falls, Wilmington is going to fall pretty easily as well. So Whiting tells the commander, William Lamb, he says, Lamb, my boy, I am come to share your fate. You and your garrison are to be sacrificed. So Terry's army lands January 13, 1865. They land... Uh, just upland from here, between Fort Fisher and the main Confederate reinforcements. They isolate the fort. Terry comes up, he reconnoiters, and he decides this fort can be stormed and captured. So two days later, they attack. Porter begins by bombarding from the sea with the big guns. He silences all but four of the Confederate cannon. So the bombardment this time works. Last time it was pretty much defeated by the Confederate gunners. This time, that does not happen. The first attack they make is a force of sailors and marines. 
the land at the corner where the seawall and the land wall meet. So they charge with pistol and cutlass to try to storm the walls. The attack goes really badly. This is a bunch of people from different ships who had probably never worked together before. They're supposed to attack in three ra- waves. They all just kind of charge together and they become disorganized. The Confederates fire heavy volleys into them and drive them back. But as that's going on and that attack is being defeated, it's serving an important purpose. Unintentionally, but it is serving an important purpose and it's distracting the Confederates from what's happening right down here on <coughs> excuse me, the river road, the other end of the land line. That's where Terry's main infantry force was attacking at the river gate. So at 2 p.m., the first troops start to march out. An advance party with axes comes up, chops through the abatis, the obstacles, as well as the palisade we see here. The Confederate defenders that are still here come up, they start shooting their rifles at the Federals. They advance, they have snipers out, and are taking down many of the Federals. The Federals continue to push forward and climb these tall, uh, impressive walls. The Federals are pretty easy, quickly able to gain a foothold. And the Confederates here, the commanders land Whiting look back, and they see Union battle flags on the end of the fort. So they quickly rush over and try to organize a counterattack. This is what Lamb wrote. In order to make a careful reconnaissance of the position of the enemy, I passed through the Sally Port. Outside of the work witnessed a savage hand-to-hand conflict for the possession of the fourth gun chamber on the left bastion. So he's coming out somewhere in this area. He's actually going out of his works to look and see what's going on. He says, my men led by Whiting had driven the standard bearer from the top of the traverse and the enemy from the parapet in front. They had recovered the gun chamber with great slaughter and on the parapet and on the long traverse of the next gun chamber, the contestants were savagely firing into each other's faces. In some cases, clubbing their guns being too close to load and fire. Usually in the Civil War, when the enemy gets a foothold into your fort, it pretty quickly falls apart. Not at Fort Fisher. The battle goes on here for hours. Very fierce fighting over these mounds that we see here. Whiting himself leaves a counterattack. His men clash with the Federals. Several uh, uh, Union soldiers order him to surrender. He refuses. He is shot. He's wounded, taken to the hospital, and dies uh, some days later in captivity. Confederates were making some progress. They were recapturing some of these works. Getting back around they had lost, but then uh, the fleet comes into play. Porter's gunboats, with great accuracy, begin to fire down on the Confederate troops, throwing them into disorganization. Night begins to fall. The battle is continuing into the night, lit by musket flashes. So Lamb is doing all he can do. He's going into the casemates, urging the wounded and the sick to come out and fight because they are very close to being able to drive the enemy out. But the tide's turning with the fire from the gunboats and they're being pushed back. So Whiting is sending messages to Bragg, begging him for reinforcements. He still thinks if reinforcements are landed at the tip that they will be able to uh, recapture the fort. Bragg thinks the fort is in no real danger, it's not going to fall, so instead he sends a new commander to take over and removes Whiting from command. But just as that commander lands, a few minutes later, the fort surrenders. Because by 9.30, the Confederates have very little hope left. The entire seawall was silenced. The Federals are in the inside of the fort. They have positions fortified there. um, And the Confederates are on the last traverse. So just before 10 p.m., Whiting officially surrenders the fort. The Union Army in this attack lost 664, the Navy 393. Confederates lost 583 killed and wounded, plus the rest of the fort captured. One month later, Wilmington was cut off and the Confederacy was completely cut off from the rest of the world. So this this defense of this fort is a great example perseverance and bravery as these confederates held out fighting against the superior union forces holding uh, the fort while it was still in union hands thanks for watching if you enjoyed this video please subscribe and share it with your friends 
You can also visit www.discerninghistory.com for more videos and other resources.